In this video, learn one simple, effective trade traders are not making enough, surprisingly. Hi, I'm Mike Bellafuri, co-founder of SME Capital, and we're a proprietary trading firm located in Midtown Manhattan. And I'm also the author of the trading classic, One Good Trade and The Playbook. Click our subscribe button so you don't miss any of the videos that we're producing for you in the trading community. See how a savvy SMB intern breaks down in step-by-step -step detail a trade you should consider adding to your trading playbook. Let's get to work. So the play I'm focusing on here is a false sector strength market play on Wells Fargo last Tuesday. So this is one of my favorite trade ideas, uh, the idea of capturing sector rotation. I'm looking for um, a sector that has showed an extended period of relative strength and isolating the point at which we see a turn and a shift to relative weakness. Um, at that point, I understand that longs are trapped and I can really catch a big move to the downside. Similarly, I'm looking on the short side or on the long side for a sector that has shown extended periods of relative weakness and isolating the point at which we see a shift to relative strength. At that point, I understand that shorts are trapped and I can catch a move to the upside. So this is why I was watching XLF uh, going into this week, just because XLF has been one of the weakest sectors in the market for weeks now. And so that morning, we broke over pre-market high and shown signs of early relative strength. This is pretty uncharacteristic for XLF, especially since like um, sellers have been in control of XLF for a really long time. Where'd you get this idea from? Uh, so the, I was watching, so initially I was trading false continuation and like continuation, like second day plays. And a lot of that was in tech. And to be honest, I was re like early on the, a lot of those moves and I was talking to Jeff about it and Jeff brought up a trade he made on JPM, uh, that week where he essentially looked at, all right, I see this change in characteristics from a strong sector to a weak sector. And he captured on that move. And then when I went back to look at a lot of these false continuation plays that I was looking for, I realized that the point at which they turned was when the whole sector turned and with that shift from relative strength to re relative weakness happened. There's a lot of edge in this particular trade. This is something I encourage you to continue to study. This is something, by the way, that if at the end of your time with us, you can get to work, uh, we'd want to hear that. That would probably get you hired uh, if you could get this to work. Um, and what I mean by that is this is something that definitely works. The, there's a, there's, a re, there's an underly, underlying reason why this trade would work. It has to do with market structure. It has to do with uh, big players and them taking time to get into positions, and them taking time to get out of positions, uh, and them uh, seeing that a certain sectors they need to lighten up in or add to, that they leave footprints of. You know, so the market is 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 dominated by big money traders. And big money traders are coming in and coming out of different sectors. They are placing bets based on the way that they trade or invest. And it takes them a long time to get into these positions and it takes them a long time to get out of these positions. So when they're getting into these positions, you might notice, hey, XLF is relatively stronger than the overall market. Hey, the big money traders are leaving footprints. We can see, we can read that they are overvaluing the bank stocks, the financial stocks right now relative to everything else. And it's good for us to make a play in maybe one of those names or maybe the, the ETF. And, you know, essentially what we're saying is they're the smart money and, and they don't even have to be the smart money. It's really not that. It, it, it's really the very best type of trading that you can do as a short-term active trader is you are recognizing patterns. You're recognizing what is most likely to happen. And what is most likely to happen when you see these footprints is they will continue 
stocks will continue in a certain direction. Um, and things get overbought, and then people need to lighten up. And we need to sort of revert to the mean or move to a, a, a more realistic price. And so, yeah, let's say XLX, XLF gets overbought, we, we know that there's gonna be a period where they're gonna take some profits and, and it'll pull in, and maybe it's relatively weaker than the overall market, and we can see that. Big money traders are leaving footprints. The volume's elevated, the selling is elevated relative to the overall market, we can see that. These are really terrific trades to try and playbook, to master, to add to your trading system. You can build models off of ideas like this. I would highly encourage you to try and get this to work for you. I really, I, I really love this. I really love this trade. I can't be more excited for you to study this trade. I almost want to say to you, don't do anything else. I wouldn't do that to you. Uh, don't do anything else but this trade. And, and the reason I, why I wouldn't say that to you is actually I just got off the phone with a former world-class tennis player, had been as high as 26 in the world. And we were talking about, uh, we were talking about our kids and then playing sports. And I asked him a question about my son uh, seeking advice because he's an elite, he, 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 he is an elite player, was an elite tennis player. I mean, 26 in the world is pretty elite. Um, and I, you know, I was sort of seeking advice um, about making, I, I basically was saying I, I, I want my son to play a bunch of different sports and not just focus on baseball, which is his first love, and, and maybe even the sport he has the best chance in because that's actually, these other sports will actually give him a chance to be better at one sport. But also you don't really know what your talents are gonna be until you get a bit, little bit older, and I had that experience growing up. Uh, and he agreed, when he was younger, he played different sports, and they didn't, they didn't take tennis seriously until a little bit later. And those other sports help you develop as a trader. And we adopt that philosophy here at SMB, which is we want you to try a bunch of different things and to see which ones you like the best and to see which ones are best for your talents and to get that broad experience and base of different strategies so that in the end, you are a stronger, better overall trader. Having said that, I would love for you to spend a lot of time on this strategy and would love to hear by the end of your internship that you've gotten this trade right and you can add value to the firm with this particular trade. It's that good of an idea for short-term traders. No, I think you're 100% right. Um, this is something like I've been tracking just more and more every day, just realizing uh, just pretty much a lot of the big trends that happen in the market, I can catch just by watching these sectors. Um, so just at this point, it's really just isolating like which setups are the best um, and like trying to figure out which clues are the most important in signifying the, like the, what move is to come. So moving on now, um, so the, the morning on Tuesday, we broke over pre-market high and shown signs of early relative strength. Uh, so this is uncharacteristic. This is something that uh, we're not seeing in XLF as of late. And so... However, when the market turned on XLF and we pulled into VWAP and pre-market high, there are almost no buyers. Now, this is pretty uncharacteristic of something that's showing relative strength, especially when we consider how important these value areas are on an intraday scale. Um, so I'm pretty confident in the short, actually, at this point, because I've seen XLF do this almost similar pattern last Thursday, where we showed relative strength in the morning, it looked like we were going to trend for the rest of the day. Market showed weakness, we flushed, and there was a shift in trend. Like buyers almost disappeared and we showed relative strength again. And then from there, there were large moves to the downside because of those morning longs were trapped. Uh, so in terms of trading vehicle, I chose WFC or Wells Fargo because Wells Fargo has historically been one of the weakest financial names in the sector. Um, in terms of intraday setup, I was looking to short on a hold under VWAP and add at the first touch of the 21 EMN. 
This is a short trend setup that I've found to be pretty effective, especially as of late. In terms of price targets, so my PT1 was low of day, PT2 was yesterday's high, and PT3 was yesterday's close. Um, my reasons to sell were after a trend down, a higher low being put in on a five minute time frame, a high volume capitulation candle. So that's telling me that, all right, now buyers are taking control and the volume's there to back it up. A uh, break and hold of VWAP or a break and hold of 21 EMA, which would be pretty uncharacteristic, especially for Wells Fargo. Um, in my make or break point, so this is something that a senior intern and I have been discussing for a while now. And basically the idea of the make or break point is it's telling me that if this were to happen, I don't want to even be looking at the short anymore. Like that plays over. I need to be readjusting my mindset. So in terms of Wells Fargo, we broke under VWAP, we're consolidating under, and we put in a wick um, telling me that sellers are there to defend it. If we're all of a sudden able to break over that VWAP level and hold over, then if anything, that's telling me that this is a potential short trap and I want to get out since we were showing relative strength in the morning. If you want to learn three real world setups that our traders use, including the simple setup that we teach all of our new traders and the setup that turned one of our traders into a seven figure big money earner, check out the free webinar that we're currently running. Just go ahead and click the link that should be appearing right now at the top right hand corner of your screen. That's going to open up this free registration page in the new window. So don't worry, you're not going to lose this video. You're going to learn more in a couple of hours from this trading workshop than from years of online education. So now into Wells Fargo. So I put a, together a list of pretty much the top names in the financial markets um, and put it on a one year time frame. And as you can see, Wells Fargo is clearly just one of the weakest names in the market. Um, this is something that like I talked to Carlton about two, um, two, three days ago, and he brought up a really great analogy of give me the gazelle with the broken leg. And I think that's exactly what I'm trying to isolate here. Wells Fargo is that gazelle with the broken leg. So really quick, I want to touch on SPY at the time. So this were my thoughts going into the morning. Um, we had just come off 306, high volume um, uptrend. We were gapping up in the pre-market because of reports of the cancellation of China's trade deals were actually false. Um, feds were also putting down ideas of a potential bubble burst. So because of that, my primary was the long. However, I was looking at um, 311, 312 as an extremely key level since that's the 10 day point of control. And I'm thinking at the same time that for a secondary, if buyers don't show strength right out of the morning, we could see a retracement there, in which case I'd be looking at a lot more of those short setups. Going into the morning, as you can see um, on the five day scale, XLF is clearly one of the weaker sectors in the market. And on Monday, the previous day, XLF was the weakest sector in the market. So this is a trend that I'm looking to see continue, especially as we go later into the day on Tuesday. So this is a 30 day time frame on Wells Fargo. As you can see, they defended that sellers defended that 2820 level extremely well. Um, they were very adamant on holding that level. So because we were approaching it, I was feeling pretty confident that sellers would hold, especially since there was not that great volume um, out of the morning, especially on the buy side, as well as the market was turning. So this gives me this essentially adds conviction to my short because I understand that sellers are there on a bigger time frame. So now onto XLF and SPY. So XLF is on the left, SPY is on the right. Um, as you can see, uh, in that first 30 minutes or so, we see clear relative strength on XLF. We clear pre-market highs and do this consolidation over pre-market highs. However, as we move on and SPY flushes, later in the day, in this consolidation, um, around uh, 10 o'clock to 10.30 Eastern Standard Time, we can see SPY break back over VWAP and hold, while XLF is consolidation consolidating at low of day. This is a clear shift from the morning action and telling me that there's relative weakness here. Now, if we look at last Thursday, we saw this ex pretty much exact idea play out. Um, you can see XLF on the left, we break over VWAP, push to high a day and consolidate a high a day in that first hour and a half. And as you can see, SPY is also pushing high a day at the time. But then as we break under, SPY shows weakness, we break under VWAP. Um, gradually, SPY is still showing buying strength as we're able to reclaim and move higher um, from that 12 o'clock to 2 o'clock time frame, um, Eastern Standard. But on XLF, we spend most of its, our time under VWAP and sellers are actually defending that really well. Um, this is very uncharacteristic of a relative strength name and you can clearly see how as the volume is dried up, the buying volume has really dried up as well. 
So in terms of intraday fundamentals on Wells Fargo, the thing I'm really isolating here is this 1.6 ATR. Because Wells doesn't have a catalyst of its own and it doesn't have an extremely high R vol, I'm not really expecting Wells to have an over ATR move. So with this, I'm always making sure that my price targets are fitting within that ATR to make sure I'm not unrealistically expecting something that's gonna happen on Wells that wouldn't happen because the volume isn't there and there's no catalyst of its own. After all, it is a market play. Um, so because of that, my PT3 was roughly 70% of the ATR. So that checks out within that metho methodology. So one of the things about the bank stocks is you wanna make sure that you have a significant catalyst when you're actually trading them because they uh, tend to be poor intraday traders overall. They tend to touch a lot of prices. When something has as much volume as, as it has as well at almost 50 million shares a day, that's gonna be something that's really thick. It's gonna be something that doesn't necessarily move a lot. We want things that move away from price. For, for active traders, we want, some, we want things that have a big ATR, that move away from price a lot, and we want them to have good liquidity, but not too much. We want to be in a stock and see that we're right right away. When something has that much volume, it moves very slowly when we're right, and sometimes it can be confusing as to whether or not we are right. So. Uh, that there's a, there's a disadvantage trading something that has volume that's too high. And this is something that I would characterize as generally too high to trade consistently. And its ATR is not great for what we're looking for. I mean, generally we wanna be in something that's gonna move three to five points intraday in the same direction uh, as a starting point. And so, it's, it doesn't mean we can't trade this, we can. It just means we're gonna need more to be in it. We're gonna need a better catalyst. We're gonna need better levels. We're gonna need to get in at better prices. We're gonna probably be mostly making trades to hold. You know, so we just gotta need, we, we need better reasons to be trading the stock. We need to be sure that our idea is a good one relative to some other ideas. Does that make sense? Right. No, that doesn't make a lot of sense. And this is a and this is a perfectly good this is a perfectly good setup for you to be in. You just got to make sure if you're playing for a rotational move that you're really in one or else it's going to be frustrating. Right. No, definitely. This is a, definitely not a name I want to be trading every day. Um, in terms of intraday analysis, uh, I think Bella covered it perfectly in the sense that positioning is really important, especially when I'm trying to, this is a slower trader, I'm not really trying to capitalize on emotion, it's more of playing a trend lower. Um, so in terms of an A entry, I see that wick high over VWAP as a clear um, A entry, just because I know if we're able to clear that wick after sellers have defended it, there's a very low chance of us breaking the low day and move lower, especially when buyers have shown some initiative um, at this point. And so I'm risking a wick high and I, that's about six cents from 28. And so I feel really confident in sizing in here. Next, I would look to take off uh, roughly a quarter to a third of my position at my first price target at low of day. Uh, this is where I want to be taking off risk. Uh, this is a level where intraday I'm expecting buyers to step in. Um, and I just want to have orders sitting there um, so that I don't even need to be hitting out when that level comes. The next place we're looking at of key significance is this ad level when we put in a wick under the 21 EMA. So this is a good place to add in the sense that we are consolidating at low of day. Sellers have shown initiative to defend it. However, I wouldn't classify this as an A ad for the reason why we haven't broken over the 21 EMA. We could still hypothetically break over the 21 EMA, wick higher and fail, stopping me out while moving lower. So this is where I, I don't want to be pushing more than half size of my average position if I'm keeping a stop, just because my stop will need to be a hold over the 21. Next up is my PT2. So I want to be at least 50% out at this point. 
I want to see this as this is the point where I'm in the driver's seat. I'm in the clear. Uh, most of my risk is off. And I, at this point, I'm just tr riding the trend down. Um, I'm going to be watching this correlation between XLF and SPY really closely now, making sure there's no shift between rel um, where uh, buyers are able to regain control, just because a significant amount of time has passed and we've already seen a good amount, a good move to the downside while we're coming into a value area as well. Uh, we come into my final price target, and at this point, I don't want to be holding more than a quarter to a fifth. So this is a point where now I need to distinguish whether or not I want to have a trade to hold. If I want to have a trade to hold, then I'll be looking at those reasons to sell and really isolating them as a point to be taking it off. So under those reasons to sell, I'd be scaling, taking off the final position here on the clear higher low. If I didn't want to have a trade to hold. So what's your thinking using the 21 EMA? I just found it to be a really good point in terms of uh, when in trend downs and trend ups that uh, we see clear wicks and bounces off that 21. So it's not like a point where I would start a trade off of, but I think it, from my experience, it's been a good point to add and kind of make sure that we're following trend. Yeah, and I'll, I'll add, pay attention to your best trades, your most directional trades, how uh, they don't, on the short side, they don't ever get above the 21 EMA. Pay attention on your best long trades, how they don't get below the 21 EMA. And there, and there are different EMAs to use. But it's a, it's, it's, a, it's a good, some of the guys on the desk use this as a measure that there is independent order flow in this particular name. So look, our thesis is, hey, this stock is gonna be so weak and so much weaker than the overall market and continue directionally. So using something like the 21 EMA is us essentially saying, if it's gonna be so weak and we are right with our thesis, it's never really going to get above this momentum indicator because the selling pressure is gonna be so great and so overwhelm the longs that we're just gonna tr we're gonna trade in this clear intraday trend to the downside. There's not gonna be any games about spikes that we see in this particular stock moves above VWAP, shakes people out on the short side, because there's so much order flow. There really is this rotation out of this name that the sellers cannot afford to let the opportunity for the stock to spike, because they're just gonna be sitting there on the offer selling, selling, so there's not gonna be any spikes, because they need to get out. Flip side of long side is true, people are desperate to buy. So that's why using, in this case, the 21 EMA can be very powerful for short-term trading. It's confirming, it's showing you that your thesis of directional, independently weaker than the overall market and even the sector is in place. Because normally what would happen in a stock, you know, it might trade above and below an EMA, it might trade above and below VWAP because people get confused and there's not this very clear, definable seller for an extended period of time like you're, you're finding in this particular name. So I like the idea of you playing around for with a momentum indicator like this to give you another check in your favor that your thesis is right, that your trade is right, and to stay in it. So good work there. So now looking at SPY and internals at the time, because this is a market play, this is something I'm watching closely. Uh, one thing to note is I've also seen this setup come a lot where we break over a key level or we break over VWAP and buyers fail to lift this and bring this higher. So we kind of consolidate, maybe even wick lower and lower until we see a high volume flush back under. Uh, we see this on SPY really clearly at the open. Uh, we also see tick. Tick opened pretty high on that day, 1500, and you can see just a clear downtrend all the way down, and right as SPY is flushing, Tick is also breaking zero and moving to the negatives. AD, we can see the similar type of action where we open extremely high, over 2000, just grind down, and as soon as SPY is flushing, uh, we are also flushing on AD. So this is just confirmation to me that this market move is real. Now onto my trade management. So I got short, uh, as we 
held under the um, VWAP uh, after the bounce or after the market flush. And I was seeing this action against 28. And one thing that was weird is if you could see this candle here, buyers were defending this really well. We dropped bids to 27.90, buyers defended it, and we reclaimed 28 and put in this really strong rejection candle. At this point, I cut the position thinking two things can happen. We can either break over VWAP, continue higher, at which, point, at which point I don't want to be short anyways, or we can move up to VWAP, sellers could show strength, maybe on a held offer or just um, them stacking a clear range, and I can take that short, risking a wick. So the latter happens, I take that short, uh, risking that wick high. We move lower to my first pre uh, price target at low of day, and that's where I take off a third of the position. We move higher, and I'm expecting a lower high at this point. However, we're able to peak over 27.90, and this gets me to cut uh, another six of my positions, so I'm in half. There are bids that stack at 27.80, and I'm looking for them to decrement. Uh, offers come in, we decrement, and quickly break over. At this point, I'm expecting a move higher, potentially to VWAP, and my stop now is a hold over VWAP. And at that point, I'd be taking the position off for a small green trade. However, buyers are unable to really bring this higher and 27.90 holds. At this point, we're also putting in a lower high and I feel very confident that those longs at 27.80 would be stopped out if we move lower. So I take this for a momentum ad and quickly scale out of it at first sign of strength at 27.70. So now I'm still holding that half of my core. Uh, we This is point at which I take off a piece that I don't like. I'll cover this more later, but we break under 2770, peek over, and I take a portion off. We come into a 2760, my price target two of yesterday's high. I have an order sitting there. I take it off there. And then we come into my final price target at 2740 of yesterday's close, and I take off here. Again, because this isn't something with a catalyst of its own, um, like Bella said, this is a high volume bank stop with not with no real catalyst of its own where I feel confident in a move over one ATR, I'm willing to take it off here and not really isolate a trade to hold. So in terms of trade improvements, I think two things really stand out to me. The first is sizing. As you can see, my max risk was 2% of my daily stop. Now this is something that I feel like all the checks are in my favor, right? I feel like I'm trading something where I have the trend, the, tr the price action and tape is confirming um, my belief. Uh, I have a clear um, A place to risk off of. And like I'm watching the markets and market internals and they're all backing my thesis. So with that, I should be willing to at least take honestly 15% of my daily risk. And that's something I really need to be working on because 2% to me is unacceptable. Uh, the other thing is a reason to sell. So this third piece where I took off here, uh, like I talked about earlier, I'm not happy with because it didn't cover any reason to sell, right? We broke under 2770, peaked over, and I just took it off because I, I got caught up in intraday price action or really small fluctuations in price action and took it off. But in reality, no higher low was put in. There's no real high volume here or nothing on the tape that should just scare me out of a position. We're not clearing the 21 EMA. There's no high volume capitulation. There's no reason for me to sell, in other words. Hey, Brian, can I just jump in here? Totally agree with you. You got to increase your risk on this. Like your idea of 15% or your intraday stop on this trade. Really like that adjustment. What I want to take out of this trade. This is a bread and butter for me. Um, something I really want to develop moving forward. And not only was the bigger picture idea there, but the intraday setup came as well. Uh, so I was actually speaking to one of the traders at the firm uh, regarding strategy and conviction, just because I feel like we trade a similar idea in, and in terms of like bigger picture ideas and higher time frame ideas. And he um, broke it down in terms of his process in a very simple way that I really want to take moving forward. He talked about it as big picture idea, move into intraday setup. So essentially big to small and not the other way around. And I think that's something that I want to really take moving forward. So I want to always have that higher time frame idea, uh, see that my idea is playing out from there, isolate where's that pivot point or that intraday like setup that's coming in where I can really put on risk and play my idea out well. Uh, moving forward, I, I think I touched on it a little bit earlier, but exactly that, like sizing is something 
I really need to be adding on over the weekend, I'm going to be looking to develop like a risk process or risk model in terms of where I want to be sizing. Yeah. And I like you reaching out to one of the junior traders at the desk and I would encourage you to reach out to Jack uh, and or Tristan and or Kyle uh, in your class and collaborate with them on whether or not all of you together can get this trade to work. Um, very much, very much worth studying. Hey, good job here. Really appreciate uh, the work you put into this. Highly encourage you to continue studying this trade. You're on the right track. This is a very promising trade. Very nice job laying it out. I can see you making really, I can, I can, I can see you making really solid trades in this particular strategy moving forward. Hey, go ahead and click our subscribe button so you don't miss any of the videos they were producing for you in the trading community. And please take the time to add your feedback in the comments section for what videos you'd like for us to produce next and what you found helpful from this video from all of us at SMB. Train and trade well.